Barry Penhol Narnar is going to share his insights on teaching biomedical ethics courses through a combination of online materials, group exercises, class activities, and case studies to compare student achievement and learning experiences in both traditional and blended formats. And Barry, are you ready to take the word? I am. I am. So this course is an undergraduate level intro philosophy course. It's a 100 level course. It's typically freshmen and sophomores. It's a, we have a general education. We have in general education domains, and students have to take a course in each domain, and two courses in two domains. And this is the, the moral reasoning domain. Uh, the learning objectives for that domain have to do with uh, understanding the uh, the basis for some foundational moral values, identifying specific behaviors related to the, those values, and then to uh, be able to make an argument, uh, articulating a reason for a particular course of action. Uh, but articulating a counter argument for a different course of action and responding to that to that counter argument. So that's sort of my mandate uh, for this course. Uh, typically, first or second year students. My university is not a traditional liberal arts college. We're a professional oriented school, and what has kept us healthy and thriving has been our our health professions program. So most of our or many of our students in the College of Arts and Sciences. Are, are preparing for careers in the health professions. We have a lot of um, pre-admit programs where as an undergrad, they are admitted to major in biology, but they're pre-admitted to physician's assistant program. So if they maintain a grade point average, um, uh, they, uh, they are automatically admitted into our graduate program. So it's those students that tend to choose the biomedical ethics course uh, as their way of meeting the gen ed requirement. So what I've been doing for the last couple of years uh, is simply teaching one course in a traditional format and the other course in a, in a hybrid section, uh, basically just to see how that affects uh, how, how they learn. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a traditional course, a lecture discussion kind of course, and basically all I have done is record all my lectures in iMovies and upload them to YouTube so that the students are watching, the, the students in the hybrid section are watching those lectures uh, before before they before they come, um, they have, they take weekly quizzes, which are due before I meet with them, and then I use the thing in Canvas that evaluates you know which of the questions they struggled with, and that and that sort of then uh, determines what I do in the time that I, that I meet with them. Uh, so just what the course covers: the introductory unit introduces students to five basic moral principles and their and their grounding in Western moral philosophy. Then I do a unit I call the basic issues, informed consent, privacy and confidentiality, uh, et cetera. And every year I throw out one of those and maybe add a new one. Then the next unit is on end of life care, about the right, right, right to refuse treatment, uh, uh, advanced directives, uh, moral evaluation, when it's appropriate to refuse or withhold or withdraw a right to stand in treatment. And then we always have great fun debating whether uh, we should allow healthcare professionals to kill their patients. Uh, or help them. And then the last unit is on uh, justice issues, uh, ethical issues underlying healthcare systems, primarily focusing on uh, justice and rights and access to healthcare. And then finish up um, too quickly the debates related to, to, to Obamacare. Uh, so I have long been using PowerPoint. Uh, the, you know, when I was in PhD work uh, or in undergrad, obviously there was no such thing as PowerPoint. But my favorite professor, the professor I ended up doing my PhD under, always handed out detailed outlines. So at the beginning of my career, I handed out detailed outlines. When PowerPoint came along, those outlines became PowerPoints. Uh, so I've been teaching that way for for a long, long time. Um, of course, it has a major test on moral principles at the end of that uh, theoretical section. Uh, then they do two case studies that require them to um, uh, identify why I mean, all the cases are things that are genuine moral dilemmas. They have to identify why it's a moral dilemma, showing which principles are pointing in one direction, which principles are pointing in another direction. They uh, argue for a resolution of that dilemma and defend the resolution. Uh, Articulate a counter argument and, and why they don't find that counter argument persuasive. Uh, and then there's a, a comprehensive final exam. Um, now, the only the two courses are identical in terms of how they're graded. It's based on all that, except that the ones in the hybrid class have the, have weekly quizzes, uh, which also affect their grades. And, and my intention 
uh, and, and, and I'm, I don't know that I'm very good at this, I, I want those weekly quizzes to be really easy. I mean, I want those, if, if you've listened to the lecture, you should be able to answer these questions. The questions on the, on the, on the test and the final exam are meant to be uh, more, more complex and more difficult. We, we can study how, how good I am at that. I'm, I'm not sure. I was, there was one quiz I was going to show you, and as soon as I started looking at quizzes, far too hard <laughs> uh, for, uh, for, for what I intended. Uh, so so in, the, in the hybrid class, typically what they do is look at several online presentations. A total of 45 minutes. I went to the session yesterday on a good online presentation and learned that my presentation should be no longer than six minutes long. Uh, ever since then, my head has been going back to, okay, how can I break up my, my generally 15 minute to 25 minute lecture presentations into, into blocks? I, and I do think that would be a useful thing to do. They're, they're assigned readings. Uh, often those readings are referenced in the online presentations. Uh, then they do these quizzes. Um, that are due the day before class so that I have time to see what, what they've uh, had trouble with and tailor what I do uh, in the class based on that. Uh, and then I've lately I've incorporated group exercises. I divide the, let the groups, let the students form themselves into groups of four or five, and I'll show you a group exercise. And, and I've found that what works best is, again, to have them uh, report their work the day before class so I can look at their work and then decide how to incorporate what they have done in their groups uh, into, the, into the classroom then. I think because of time, I'm going uh, to take show you a couple of my online presentations at the end. Um, so then what do I do in the class? And, and I've, st I've, st I've never forgotten the first day I was headed to class realizing they had already watched my lecture. And all I knew to do in a class was stand up and give a lecture. Crap, what am I going to do? Uh, and I think <laughs> in the beginning what I did was I just repeated the lecture, you know, <laughs> sort of guessing what would be, what would be their struggle. Um, I, I think that that's the main thing I've gotten better at, using the quizzes. Even when I first started using the quizzes, I would, I would go in and lecture too much, recovering the stuff they struggled with. So now I try to do that review just really quickly, five, ten minutes at most, and then have activities, uh, discussions for them to do in their groups. And I usually try to have them working in the same groups that they're, that they're doing their formal group <coughs> practice uh, in, in the classroom. Uh, so here's a typical group exercise that I, that I now have them do in advance. And then, uh, and then uh, bring it into that the, the day that we meet. Uh, they had four cases, all involving something to do with end of life care and, 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 and the uncertainty about whether to to uh, to do a do, a do not resuscitate order or not, or to do the next round of chemotherapy or not, uh, to put the person on the respirator or not. Uh, and then I had them in their groups. So what are the moral considerations or principles pointing in the opposite direction? Uh, I use a, a textbook by Post and Bluestein. I'm on an ethics committee in our hospital, and this is our ethics committee textbook. And I discovered it was better than any of the textbooks, uh, or I found it more useful than any of the textbooks that I'd seen. Um, and so I asked them, if they look, what, what did Post and Bluestein say about this particular case? Uh, then I, you know, getting them ready to write their own case study, and make the best possible argument you can for uh, discontinuing whatever life sustaining treatments in question. Make the best possible argument you can for um, for continuing it. You can see those are the most points, and then sort of enforce them at the end and then say, okay, what, talk about this as a group. Uh, you know, almost turning each of those groups into a new hospital ethics committee, right? So um, I just went back and looked in the fall. I mean, I always do this in the fall. I looked at the. Looked at Remember, the, the assessments for these, these two groups of students, traditional classroom, hybrid classroom, are identical, uh, except the, the hybrid folks, their grades are affected by those quizzes. Uh, the first test on principles, you can see the traditional section, the grades varied from 66 to 99. The, uh, the uh, hybrid section is 53 to 97, then the overall grade. The average score uh, was a little bit lower. 
in, in the hybrid section, but I don't know about you, I don't consider that a significant difference. I mean, particularly looking at one class, we're looking at 25 students in each section. Uh, that strikes me as, as, as not significant. The final exam, the objective portion, again, you can see the range. Uh, interesting, I had a hybrid student make 100, uh, and, and their average score was actually a little higher. But notice the deviation is greater in the hybrid section. And I, and I, I think that's what I see every semester. I'll see lower lows, maybe a higher high, higher highs um, and in their, their final grades. Uh, again, you see the, uh, the hybrid section having lower lows in the, in the middle season. Should I be embarrassed that I didn't fail anybody? Excuse me, that nobody failed. <laughs> uh, so what I think I've learned is that there are no significant differences between learning outcomes. Um, but, but, but I do think that hybrids work for some students and don't work for others. And, and, I, and I have learned to sort of tell students the first day of class, look, if you know you're not going to discipline yourself to sit down and watch these and do this work outside of class on a timely fashion, uh, if you know you have problems multitasking so that you're going to be watching these, I never forget the first time I did this, about three weeks in, I asked him how it was going. One kid raised his hand and says, it took me a long time to figure out that I needed to pay attention to your online lectures <laughs> the same way I would, you know, an in-class lecture. And I remember thinking, so if I was him, what would, it, yeah, I would have turned the lecture on, gone over and made myself a peanut butter <laughs> sandwich, you know, listening to it. Uh, sitting on the computer, I had to check some email. Or it took him a while, and I warned students about that, you know. Mm -hmm. Sit down, give it the same attention, of course, the same attention you would give a classroom lecture. What does that mean? Do they not look out the window in classroom? Do they not check email? Yeah, so, um, but, but I, I, mean, I think what I like about hybrid teaching is it really does force students to take responsibility for their own learning in a way that a traditional classroom and a lower level lecture course doesn't. You know, we just pour the knowledge in and they spit it out. Um, this requires a little more engagement on their part, but it doesn't work for everybody. Yeah, as I always, always, said, always said, the biggest challenge was, for me was how to effectively use the traditional classroom time. Uh, learned that a, that a very brief review, not, not just another lecture, uh, or creative group work, uh, is most effective, but particularly when they've done the group work in advance. But students don't like group work, and, 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 and selling students on that is very, very difficult. Um, as I've already said, I've learned I need to shorten my uh, presentations into, into shorter blocks. I sort of assume my students are technologically savvy, and that I can sort of sh quickly show them once where everything is on Canvas. But then in the last week of this lecture, somebody will say, oh, I didn't realize that was up there. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm learning, and it, it, this really applies to the traditional class or the, uh, or the hybrid one. Uh, I need to assist students in navigating Canvas better. Yeah. And uh, as I've thought about, so how would, I, how would I do this totally online? I, still, I feel like I still have a lot to learn about how I would do it totally online because that, that classroom time with the hybrid, hybrid section is really essential. And I, not, I haven't figured out yet how I would replace that if I, if I went totally online. How much time do I have? You have seven months. All right, so uh, one of the things I promised was sharing some insights about making uh, online presentations. Uh, I've got three uh, to show you, and it sort of shows my evolution. So this is an early one. Is there any way we can get this particular lecture concerns the relationship between the different principles and the question of ends? We didn't think about sound, did we? A couple of things here. This is all just audio behind PowerPoint. And also, I'm illegally using music out of my iTunes. Uh, sometimes, when you upload to YouTube, it catches that and it will tell you. So now in iMovies, I use the free sound. So that's sort of what I did first. Probably because I didn't know how to do anything else. All right. Good ends or good intentions, intention to promote human welfare. 
You all can't hear that really at all, can you? Can we get a thumbs up in the back if you can hear What's that? We're going to get being picked up by the mic. Huh, okay. So then I went to this, which was embedding. So now what I'm doing is embedding the video in the PowerPoint. Um, is it more effective to have the face and the human being? I think it is. Uh, I, mean, I think that really does add something instead of just a voice back there. Uh, I mean, because you're losing some of the humanity doing it online anyway, but this makes a little humanity. They can't interrupt me and ask questions or, or scream at me. But uh, we heard a lot about lighting in the uh, session yesterday. Uh, this is in my home office. There's a window to my left. There's a window behind me that sometimes causes me trouble. If, if I'm working at 6 o'clock in the morning and the sun is coming up, I have to put it up here. Put up a sheet to, to block that light, but I have no lights except you know, the, the light that's coming in. All right, so it is, this last one is the most recently made, and it's what I do now. And I don't know whether it's better or not or worse. So now you see the video is the whole screen, and I put the PowerPoint. Secondly, when we have to make decisions for patients, allowing them to die is sometimes morally acceptable. That is to say, by withholding or withdrawing some like sustaining treatment. It's generally recognized that there is no moral difference between withdrawing and withholding a like sustaining treatment. So we may make a decision not to start a respirator in some situations. I think I like this best. I mean, I've never sort of watched these with a group of peers and thought about what works best. And, but this is what I've ended up doing. Artificial nutrition and hydration uh, may be re refused or withdrawn or withheld like any other medical treatment. Uh, one of the things I heard yesterday about camera angles, I, had, I didn't think about camera angles, but it's obvious if you watch films that somebody's in authority and power that camera is low and looks up at them. And the presenter yesterday said, if you're recording a lecture, make sure your camera is at least eye level and not, not, not higher so it's looking down at you. I was really worried because I use a Logitech camera on the top of my iMac screen. But I, but I think I probably sit up tall in my chair. And, and so it probably is about eye level. Uh, so thank you very much.